uh, give us a smile, Dakota. Come on. <laughs> there we go. I'll get it out early. Yeah. Um, <laughs> sitting at the kitchen table this weekend, had uh, an old hockey injury come back to bite me and the front tooth fell out. So I sent Joe a text and I said uh, the webinar might be a little interesting there on Monday. So. Okay, welcome everyone to our final webinar of the, what is it, 2023-2024 season. Uh, so we got an excellent panelist, uh, uh, lineup of panelists tonight. We're doing things just a little bit different. Um, normally we've got three farm panelists, uh, which is uh, kind of the format we go with. So um, we wanted a few different perspectives tonight. Um, so we do have a, a farmer that is utilizing cover crops to establish uh, perennial hay. Uh, that's why a gut friend um, uh, from Alberta, uh, but we also have on Paul Gregory, who is the owner of Interlake Forage Seeds, um, so we, we partnered with uh, to do perennial seeds with. So Paul's got 40 years of experience in this field. Uh, so it really is an industry expert as far as, um, you know, plant species, uh, everything. Uh, he, Paul's lived in the world of perennial hay for uh, quite a long time. Uh, and our third panelist tonight is uh, Covers & Co. Uh, newest employee, uh, Dakota Odgers. So Dakota came from um, uh, Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds. So Dakota's um, put together a little bit of a presentation as far as funding options available for uh, perennial hay. So um, yeah, we've kind of got three different gambits. Really looking forward to it. We got three smart guys um, talking about uh, this topic tonight. Mm -hmm. Whoop, I can't push that button. So as per usual, uh, I was reminded the day after, sorry if you were on for the Gabe presentation, I forgot to give away the jacket and hat, uh, but what an awesome webinar. Uh, my apologies, uh, I will remember tonight to give it away. So questions go in the Q&A uh, and not the chat, Q&A. Um, and then at the end of the webinar, I'll pick uh, two questions that were my favorite. We had a ton of questions uh, come in. Um, for the registration so we got a really good start but um for sure we want to encourage interaction um so if there's something that uh one of the three panelists say during their presentation put it in the q a and i'll do my best to to get to it um at the q a session so um like i said these are the three panelists um dakota wyatt and paul um i'll introduce them again of course once we get rolling here uh but where i'm going to start is kind of the concept of plant diversity uh, if you've been on this before, I've been through this exact slide before, um, but the concept of plant diversity with the context of sowing down perennial hay. So uh, we use this slide a lot. Basically, it is describing uh, monocultures versus uh, the principles of Mother Nature, which is Mother Nature grows things in diversity, uh, diversity of plants and diversity of ecosystems. So the idea with uh, utilizing plant diversity is using each plant uh, to produce a root exudate to stimulate a diversity of biology, attract that biology to the root zone, and access uh, the free living or the the minerals that are existing or tied up in our soils, break those down, uh, deliver them to the plant, and create that symbiotic relationship between the plant and the soil biology. Uh, something that uh, a good friend of mine, Ryan Boyd, told me years ago um, when we were talking about this specific subject of utilizing cover crops to sow down um, land into perennial hay is uh, what are the benefits of this? Uh, and Ryan told me, and it just hit like a light switch, you know, if you're going into a diverse perennial system anyway, the goal is to stimulate that biology by, you know, using cereals and legumes to really uh, capture more biology and feed uh, that perennial hay system to reduce inputs uh, on that blend. So why not, if the goal is to stimulate biology anyway, utilize plant diversity in year one to stimulate that uh, biology and it's there for that perennials uh, to establish in the fall and also obviously have a productive hay stand going into the following year. So this is an example of uh, the real world example of the cartoon that I just showed you of a full season cover crop. Um, so that is the uh, Cole's notes of uh, what's going on as far as concept with 
uh, plant diversity and uh, utilizing plant diversity to establish perennial cover crops. Um, obviously, we're going to get a lot more into it tonight. Um, Wyatt, so if you want to turn your screen on and uh, turn your mic on. So this is uh, Wyatt Gutfriend from Rolling Hills, Alberta. Um, why, why don't you tell us a little bit about your, uh, your family, uh, your four-legged children here, and uh, what your farming operation looks like? So I've been uh, growing these cover crops for about four, this will be the fourth season now, and absolutely loving them. Uh, it's great nutritional for our cattle, and it's just nice to lower the inputs of our crops. So when I'm improving my soil and improving my water infiltration, water retention, it just seems right when I don't have to put that huge amounts of fertilizer down, right? So it is helping everything on our operation and we can just be a little more green and help our place, but also balancing that nutrition for our cattle that is not just a monocrop. So we've had really good benefits with it, less mineral needed and just the cattle are way healthier with it. So every everything that that's why I became a dealer is because I absolutely love this product and I believe so, in it. So. so tell us a little bit about your operation, Wyatt. What uh, uh, what do you got going on on the farm? So we uh, have about 360 cows that we uh, uh, graze or that we uh, calve out and then we keep all of our calves too and graze our yearlings and sell them um, in the fall. And there, it's been great for us. Um, I'm here with my new fiance and my parents, and it's been just a good operation that we've been uh, able to walk into. So, so what has like what has your experience been with perennial hay, Wyatt? And like what what does the winter forage look like on your farm? For us, uh, we produce about two thousand bales a year um, that we're going to feed for our cattle, and it's usually about ninety to a hundred acres. Uh, 80 acres of green feed depending on how much alfalfa we want to break up and we'll feed most of our green feed uh, earlier on and then go alfalfa closer to calving and it's been good we've had no problems with it uh, we graze quite a bit in the fall too that's one thing that we really like about the cover crops is we'll graze our third cut and graze the regrowth of these cover crops and really happy with how much grazing we get out of it. Um, we used to do just like a barley and Italian rye for a uh, green feed and we'd fertilize that and everything, but we never did get the regrowth that we did from these cover crops with the Italian rye. Like it did help and it was something, but it never grew as tall and as thick. Like it was always just a, well, hopefully we get something kind of thing, right? Yeah. Well, let's get into it, Wyatt. We got lots of questions of producers that are on tonight wanting to know kind of the nuts and bolts of, of what you did. We got lots of people that are, are going to be doing this practice this year. So what are we looking at? Talk a little bit about seeding date, what conditions were like uh, when you were seeding. And Sorry about that. My dog is just making some noise here. It's uh, <laughs> <That's> all good. <laughs> uh, this here is uh, seeded um, end of May, and it's from June 6th is when I took this picture. Just one second. All good. Oh, you gotta love uh, the fur babies involved in here. <laughs> we got a dog here too. And why, Sorry about that. <laughs> why, if your dog makes too much noise, I got a dog sleeping right underneath me. So that's probably good. <laughs> All right. So anyways, yeah, we seeded that end of May. We tried to go middle to end of May for the cover crops around here uh, under irrigation. And that this is from June 6. You can see that it's just starting to establish its... Uh, hierarchy and starting to figure out what's gonna really flourish um, so what did you use for a seeding rate i, I guess th three questions wyatt yep. seeding tool what you uh what you used how you applied the uh perennial hay uh and i've forgotten the third but i bet it'll come back to me so uh we just kind of did uh exactly what we say with all these cover crops uh, three quarters of an inch depth we used a disc box drill or I, uh, we hire a neighbor to do that because with calving and everything, it gets a little bit hectic. So we did that. And then we seed the alfalfa all at the same time. And it's less than half an inch depth for the alfalfa. And we put 15 pounds of alfalfa down with the cover crop. And so you were just mixing those two together in the box, Wyatt? Uh, two different uh, two different boxes. boxes. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, he uh, was able to separate them. So he just puts alfalfa in a box behind and 
we get that different depth. So it, um, it's worked very well. We've had a really good um, catch with it, germination. Uh, no complaints there at all. It's I've even noticed uh, quicker green uh, the alfalfa greening up quicker with where the full season was compared to the other alfalfa right next to it under the same pivot. It greens yeah. up quicker and it grows quicker, like probably a week difference. So what do you see as far as early establishment of the alfalfa? And I mean, once we get kind of towards uh, um, harvest time, um, I just, I want to, I want to not lose sight of this point, just what your strategy is as far as when to harvest that crop. But maybe let's start here. We got, we got a couple pictures, uh, uh, same time here as well. And you can see the alfalfa starting to come. But uh, yeah, maybe just touch on what you used as far as seeding rate and then just what you were seeing throughout the year. Yeah, like uh, so I guess about 60 pounds or 65 pounds the acre with the cover crop, like um, we suggest, and then uh, 50 pounds of alfalfa. But um, for what well, we noticed that when we, you said you want to know when we like cut it, we usually like to cut it around that milk to dough stage and um that usually gives it enough for the alfalfa to establish but yet still can um not going to hurt it too much right and we like to keep it fairly moist like as soon as the crop is off we're going to put more water back on it right away because we don't want those small alfalfa plants to uh Burn get up. stressed at all yeah. but um we found that it that alfalfa was competing in the regrowth it, it was probably eight inches tall um, when we when we had about a foot and a half of regrowth. Like it, it really competed um, in our regrowth. It was actually quite nice to see. And we did graze it, but we didn't graze it as hard that first year. Like normally we'll graze the cover crops right to the ground. But when we have a juvenile alfalfa in there, we won't. Yeah. So maybe talk about, uh, obviously we got the pivot here, uh, just how much moisture you put on through the year and maybe just like, how do you strategize where and when to put moisture? So for us, it's kind of a little bit difficult um, because that pivot is a 360 acre pivot. So it takes four days to put one inch down. And the last four or five years, we've had next to no rainfall. So that pivot pretty much runs all summer long. And because it's in the same pivot with alfalfa. So by the time it gets around, alfalfa is used up all the moisture that we put down. So mm -hmm. that one probably um, that year with that crop, we got probably 12 to 14 inches of moisture on that crop. And but you could probably get away with both seven or eight if you needed to. Right. Um, and usually for a regrowth, we'll put two inches on and whatever grows grows but usually we're getting foot to foot and a half of regrowth on two inches so yeah. it, i wouldn't say you need any more or less than that it's it's pretty nice that way so we're in the harvest time here now Wyatt. maybe just uh i i can I, when i saw this picture i wanted to ask you this question but do you do any difference in strategy cutting height when you have something under seeded no, nope, uh, we just run our disc vine as low as it can go and uh, cut it right down. Yeah, uh, picture of it here. Yeah, we we, we just uh, do the exact same thing. The disc vine's good because it actually will crimp it and allow our dry down time. Like we did do a trial and had 90 acres side by side of the full season and uh, a barley and the dry down time was no different cut with the exact same implement. So um it's really good that way. Like I wouldn't worry about dry down time. Uh, well, maybe talk about time talk time about time. your dry your dry down time. What what you saw? Uh, it's anywhere from like six to ten days, usually average, depending on heat units that you're getting at that time. Uh, it it's real like for us. We as soon as it's dry enough, we're going, and we don't usually wait for that optimal moisture where a lot of people are wanting. Like if it's under 15%, usually we're bailing until it's 0% and just keep on going because if, if it, a dry feed is still better than uh, a rained on feed for us. So, oh, 100%. And the, the, I get in trouble saying this, but it's like, oh, some years if it's saying 20 and there's a storm coming the next day, I just wrap it up. Yep. <laughs> uh, 
Well, maybe we see what the bales look like here, but I, this is kind of more interesting uh, and more on topic, I guess, of what we're talking about. Just, uh, I mean, it's, it says here you, two inches of moisture. Obviously, you did that with the with the irrigation, but maybe just talk a little bit about your strategy in fall, what you did with water, and then uh, you talked a little bit about uh, the grazing. You managed a little bit different. Maybe just talk more specifics uh, yeah. on that. So with this one here, uh, we put two inches down and this is, we could have grazed this a lot earlier. I'm pretty sure it reached its full growth height there. Um, so uh, that image is from October 2nd, but it was probably that tall for a week or two. So it, it was growing and came back really quick we, to the point where if we wouldn't add the alfalfa in there, we probably could have took a second cut if we wanted, but we'd much rather graze it uh, just lower costs again. I put the hat in there just for uh, comparison of the height and all that. Um, it, we we do, would like to graze a little earlier sometimes, but since it's in a field with alfalfa, we usually wait for a first frost, the killing frost, and then we'll kick the cows out on it. Um, with the baby alfalfa in there, we will not graze it as hard. Um, this year, though, we didn't have any juvenile alfalfa in there, and we grazed the cover crop right to the dirt. Our cows actually ate the cover crop right to the ground and then started on the third cut alfalfa regrowth. And it was in the same pivot. They had to walk right over top of it. And we've noticed that year after year that they will walk past alfalfa to eat on these cover crops. So it just shows how tasty it is for them and they want it, right? So this specific field here, why with the juvenile alfalfa, what was your strategy going into winter as far as how much plant material you were gonna leave behind? Um, usually we would probably want to leave like just enough to keep a little bit of snow, like six inches or so. Um, this year we did get an early snowfall, so it actually lodged a bunch of, uh, the crop down. So we weren't able to figure out that exact height, I, I guess, but, um, we just kind of went until the snow was too much. And then we, uh, pulled them off and started feeding them. And when it came spring, there was six, eight inches of uh, growth that was laid over. So on a normal year, uh, we're going to come back and talk a lot about this because we had questions about this. But like on a normal growing season, what would you like on a on a mature alfalfa stand? What would you leave as far as residue? Wyatt? Uh, not much. Uh, we don't really have to worry too much about leaving um, that much growth. Uh, growth like we don't want to graze it right to nothing but we're waiting until it's actually uh killed before we graze it right like it or dormant uh, we don't want to graze it or leave it too short before it gets that killing frost because i find if it's short when it gets a killing frost then it'll winter kill but if we leave a boat uh like we'll cut in our second cut and then we just let it grow and um then we graze it after. So it has quite a bit of growth there. So we don't have to worry about it winter killing. Um, I would never, that's partly why we don't do a third cut is because we want a little bit of foliage there so that it won't winter kill. Yeah. And it'll put those nutrients back into the root system versus getting stuck kind of thing, right? What does, uh, I guess, is anything growing this spring? How did how did this crop make the winter? Uh, our, uh, that so this is actually last year was a full alfalfa with this crop um, so and it's already greening up and coming up already so we probably got uh, two inches of growth already on that alfalfa and it's already coming up right now nice no issues with winter kill uh, no no um, we did have a little bit in a couple low spots just where it lodged a lot because that year we did have quite a bit of snow in the fall um, and then it iced up, but we reseeded a couple spots that were bad and it's good. So yeah, mm -hmm. we're very happy with how it uh, uh, would like held over the winter, I guess. Cool. Well, I got questions already uh, for you, Wyatt, but for the sake of time, uh, Wyatt's going to stick around for a uh, question period. So uh, I'll get to those questions at that time. Uh, great job, Wyatt. Uh, sure. appreciate, you. appreciate having you. Dakota, you can, uh, you're up next, bud. 
So Dakota Rogers, he is our territory manager uh, in Saskatchewan. Um, Dakota, we robbed from the Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds. So he's got a bit of a background in what's going on uh, with funding. Uh, give us a smile, Dakota. Come on. <laughs> there we go. I'll get it out early. Yeah. Um, sitting at the kitchen table this weekend, had uh, an old hockey injury come back to bite me and the front tooth fell out. So I sent Joe a text and I said uh, the webinar might be a little interesting there on Monday. So we'll have a good laugh about it anyways and have fun. And I it. said it just gives you character. That, it looks That's right. Cool. That's right. Uh, so Dakota, give us a little bit about your background, uh, your farm, obviously, and kind of uh, where you came from. And then we'll start talking about some of these programs. And yeah, maybe so uh, when we get to the programs, we'll just we'll give the caveat that we're just messengers here, of course. Absolutely. Yeah. No, a little bit about myself. So I'm in Spy Hill, Saskatchewan. Uh, we're about an hour southeast of Yorkton. Um, every time I get to say that I'm a fifth generation family farmer, it brings me a lot of pride. Um, you know, it's something growing up. I still hold special uh, being able to farm with my grandpa Fred and uh, my dad, Jeff, in the picture there. Um, it's something that's always me meant a lot to me. And, and I'm just so happy that I get to be involved with it to this day. Um, a little bit about my background. I was previously with Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds. Um, delivered the Prairie Watershed Climate Program um, when I was there. Um, a lot of you guys might be familiar with that. Um, different kind of facets of it exist in each province um, through different delivery uh, delivery models, but that's a little bit about my background. And we're a mixed farm, grain and cattle, um, have a little bit of everything going on. So it's, um, it's awesome to be a part of it. And, and this is the Prairie Watershed Climate Program that Joe was talking about. So it's nitrogen management, uh, rotational grazing and cover crops. Um, that's in Saskatchewan and Manitoba. Um, and then they'd have the RDAR program um, out in Alberta to help serve in some of those facets. So cover crop uh, programming available and that's through the watersheds in Manitoba. So, in so your we're gonna, I guess just to give everyone a heads up, uh, yeah. what Dakota's prepared is just kind of going province by province. Some of the programs that are available for exactly what we're talking about tonight, which is um, sowing land into uh, perennial hay. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Oh, you're all good, Joe. And I'll give the I'll give the caveat for Dakota. Um, definitely, uh, we're just kind of making you aware of the programs. Um, we're not going to get into uh, super specifics as far as um, you know uh, exact numbers on funding and whatnot. Um, but definitely, uh, Dakota's got all the information here. This is going to be recorded on YouTube, of course. Um, and Dakota's included all the information as far as who to get a hold of. Um, we'll or Dakota will answer uh, any questions that he can. But just want to give the caveat uh, uh, that, uh, you know, we are, don't shoot the messenger if you don't get funding. We just want to make you aware that you are. Yeah, absolutely. I think that's a great point. And I think there's so many good people and so many good organizations involved in delivering these programs. Um, you know, every time that I've had a chance to reach out to them, have conversations with them, they've always been so helpful um, and kind of pointing me in the right direction. And, and a lot of times, maybe if they don't have the answer, they're willing to find the people that will. So I think the first step is just making contact and uh, just, I think on our end, we just want to make you aware. I know uh, sometimes it get confusing with all the different stuff going on in all the different provinces. So it's nice for us just kind of have it out there for you um, and allow you to kind of have those conversations and build with those great people that are in those organizations. So um, we're going to kind of run through it, Manitoba, Saskatchewan, Alberta, to the Prairie provinces, um, starting off with Manitoba and the Ducks Unlimited. Um, they have a forage program that is available um, you know, great program. Um, they have, you know, it's paying producers to sow down the grass and forage. A lot of opportunities there for producers to look at. Um, a new program that they recently have launched in the last couple of years here is a marginal areas program. Um, something that myself, I've taken advantage of in my farm in Saskatchewan. Um, it's been great. Um, and that's, you know, just looking at some of those areas on your field, uh, tougher to seed, you know, depending on the year, water situation, uh, weed problems. Um, and really exciting with Ducks Unlimited is they've actually launched with FCC, um, a little bit of a partnership there, and that's the FCC Sustainability Incentive Program. So with that, um, if you're going through Ducks in their Marginal Areas Program at your application, um, as well as you're an FCC customer, there's an opportunity there to kind of work with both those organizations to access some awesome funding there. Cool. As well, uh, kind of a unique one to Manitoba is the row program, and that's delivered through the Manitoba watersheds. Um, they have a riparian area management, buffer establishment, upland area conservation. Um, I would strongly encourage you just to have a conversation if you're in those districts, 
they have a lot of programming even outside this forage programming um, and outside what's listed um, that I think just worth having a conversation and just have getting that out there, seeing what is available, ton of opportunities for producers and uh, they do a great job out there with the Manitoba watersheds. So uh, definitely strongly encourage you to contact them and just uh, go through some different options on your operation um, as well. Like we kind of touched on at the start there. Uh, the Sorry, yeah, no worries. Uh, just the Prairie Watershed Climate Program, that's also delivered in Manitoba through the watersheds. Um, so that's the nitrogen management, cover crops, and rotational grazing. Uh, once again, some awesome program that's out there available to producers. Um, moving on to Saskatchewan, there's sustain Sustainable Canadian Agriculture Project, um, and that's through the Ministry of Agriculture, and that's the Resilient Agriculture Landscape Program. That would fall under a conversion of cropland to perennial tame forage. Um, they do have options there for a five-year land use agreement, as well as if you just want to go forward with the project. Um, the contact on that would be the Ag Knowledge Center. Um, essentially, you'll phone in um, and they'll redirect you based on your RM and your location to the specialists in your area. So definitely, and I also want to say here, um, they have a ton of amazing programming out there, even outside the team forage. So would strongly encourage you to check out their website. Once again, have those conversations because it might be one of those things um, that you're thinking about, you know, on the back of your mind, and it could be something that's out there with a the program already. Um, and then once again, in Saskatchewan, the Prairie Watershed Climate Program, that's delivered through the Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds. Um, we have the contact there um, listed there, and it's up to $35 an acre uh, for eligible cover crop projects as well. So some great pr programming out there. Um, Prairie Watersheds in Manitoba and Saskatchewan, like I talked about, um, and then SCAP and RALP are also in Saskatchewan, great opportunities. Also in Saskatchewan is Ducks Unlimited. Um, once again, some great people there. I've had a chance um, in my previous previous job as well as in this job um, to get to meet some of those people there and they are awesome. They're more than willing to kind of help you out and point you in the right direction. Very resourceful, answer any of the questions you may have. Um, they have a forage program similar to Manitoba as well as the marginal areas program that we touched on, some of those tougher to reach areas. Um, just kind of in your in your quarters that you're looking at maybe sowing down to some perennial forage um, as well. They also have the partnership with the FCC Sustainab Sustainability Incentive Program. So same uh, situation as Manitoba with that one. Um, also, there's a marginal areas rehabilitation in Saskatchewan, Mars, and that's through SAS soils. Um, that's the encouragement of those conversional marginal cropland into perennial forage. A um, little bit of a unique one with this program is even if your land's not located within the maps uh, that we're kind of showing, and the, there's the maps corresponding to the different programs on the slides. Um, if you have seven basins or 20 acres of wetland on a quarter section, um, you can seek approval for them for a project. So even outside the map, there's still opportunities there to maybe access some of that funding. And they also are accepting applications already for 2024, along with all these other programs. And Dakota, uh... Like obviously when their producers are getting a hold of these programs, like they're gonna let them know about deadlines and what and whatnot. Absolutely. Yeah, absolutely. Those are all uh, conversations on on having there. Um, all these ones right now would be open that we went through in the presentation so far. Cool. So every okay, everything that, only, that only you've caveat mentioned, with oh. everything you've mentioned up to this point, the funding's open now. Yeah. So so reach the out only one that is going to open is the FCC sustainability, and that opens in May. So that's just right around the corner there. Cool. Um, Alberta, uh, similar to Saskatchewan, now Sustainable Canadian Agriculture Partnership, and that's the route program as well. Um, they have some different ones that I have listed here. Um, they have the, I just go by activity codes. Those are probably easiest to find when you go to those funding sheets or you have those conversations. So 201 would be similar to Saskatchewan, the annual cropland conversion to perennial tame forage. Um, as well, they also have strips, grass, waterways, and salinity. So, so, so kind of unique to Alberta in that one, a bit different than Saskatchewan. Um, they have unique funding for those areas. As well, it's, uh, I think it's important to mention uh, through that program, they also have an intercropping. So that includes cover crop cocktails, um, which would be three or more annual crops planted, and it must include a one legume repulse. As well, they also have the intercrop op intercropping option there of interplanting two annual crops at the same time, but must be one pulse. Um, we listed the uh, contact information there, whether you're in Alberta or outside of Alberta, uh, your contact number is just going to be different on that one. 
As well, Alberta also has the Ducks Unlimited. They have the forage program as well as the marginal areas program. And I think it's important to touch on um, RDAR. They have some great programming going on up there as well. They have the nitrogen management, um, cover crops and strength and rotational grazing. Um, so they have cover crop funding set up a bit differently. So I think it's definitely worth a phone call there. I've heard a lot of positive responses there with the RDAR program out of Alberta, um, but they have funding available for the cover crops. I think important to mention, but they, uh, all these organizations have done a great job of getting this programming out there and, uh, and working with producers. Go to what would you recommend for if I'm a producer sitting at home watching this and you know, there's uh they want to try and pick and choose obviously the easiest one or the one like what's the best advice as far as next step and going forward? I think the biggest thing is just have the conversations with those organizations. Um, have the conversations and what maybe you have in mind, what the project is, what you're looking at doing. And I think from there they're gonna steer you um in the direction that's best fit. Um, all these organizations have done a great job of working together. Um, they really, really, you know, encourage one each other, each other, which is a great thing. Um, and I think you'll be able to know by those conversations what the best fit for your operation probably is. Cool. Um, just a little uh, plug here is just, you know, if you have those program specific questions, I think it's best to reach out to the organization. Uh, like Joe said, we're just the middleman uh, here. So we're kind of delivering the message. But I think getting down to the ins and outs of those programs, it's best just to talk to those organizations. If you have different questions going on as far as, you know, what maybe the contact is or different things like that, please feel free to reach out to me. Uh, my number is listed down there and uh, you can definitely give me a call and I can try my best to point you in the right direction. After the webinar. After the webinar. <laughs> uh, and like this slide's going to go away here, um, but Dakota's uh, like... If you guys missed any of the contact information um, that was up there, just ask a question in the Q&A. Dakota, I think you have access to the Q&A. Yeah. Um, so Dakota can find those numbers and uh, and pass them along. So if you have any questions, depending on which province you were in, who to apply to, or um, you know you didn't have a chance to write it down, um, just throw it in the Q&A and Dakota will, uh, will get you those numbers. So I always say uh, when I represent, it's a lot of information coming in, not a lot of time. So don't ever feel bad for asking questions. Yeah, a hundred percent. And Dakota's sticking around for question period too. So if you got questions uh, uh, at that time, ask away and we'll answer them to the, uh, to the best of our ability. Great job, Dakota. Thanks a lot, bud. Thanks. So Paul, if you can uh, figure out how to unmute yourself. Um, so Paul Gregory from uh, Interlake Forage Seed. Um, we're very fortunate to be partnering with Interlake Forage Seed on our perennial seeds um, this year and into the future. Uh, Paul, I got to get you to turn your uh, video on if that works. I'll see if I, there we go. Okay. It's going here. Yeah? Uh, no video, but I can hear you. There you go. You're good to go. Okay. Real so good. Paul, Paul Gregory in the flesh, everyone. Um, Paul, why don't you take uh, a few minutes and just introduce everyone uh, uh, to you, uh, your operation and your business, and uh, just kind of how you got to where you are today. Okay, for sure. Thanks, Joe. Uh, yeah, we started farming back in the uh, late 70s. Actually, I'm an old timer. I went to university with uh, Joe's dad. And, but you we, are we had, old. <laughs> <laughs> Well, we had a, we had a great time in university. We we learned a lot and, and just lifetime connections. Uh, you know, just from uh, some good profs, uh, good uh, camaraderie, and and uh, yeah, it was a, it was a great time. But just uh, that sense of community, I, I don't think we've ever lost it. And with the neighbors, uh, you know, in the seed business and the honey business, uh, leaf cutter bees. But we started farming uh, uh, originally with honey bees. We got into leaf cutter bees. And then we realized that growing alfalfa seed is is just a uh, it's a very specialized type of farming. Uh, and we started farming. I think we bought our first quarter in 1980, and uh, that was a time of 15, 20 percent interest rates. And you know, I mean, sure, a combine was 75,000, but you still had to come up with 75,000. Uh, and but you know, and what we learned is through the years, we really never did commodities until maybe 20, 25 years later, it's all about alfalfa, tree foil, uh, different grasses, native grasses, uh, good dollar value, good for the soil. And, and if you can appreciate Interlake, we've had our share of weather issues. So the wet years, the, the grasses did well, the tree foil, and the dry years, the alfalfa did, did well. So 
uh, as a first generation farmer, we realize that you have to be on in the game. And uh, I've always uh, participated in producer groups, uh, you know, different commodity groups. And, and, you know, when you get 100 miles away from your farm, you can hang out with people that are really do share information. We're not competing in the same land base and, and just, uh, to, uh, you know, you know, just being in touch with Aggies. So anyways, um, got in the seed trade probably, uh, you know, like within 15, 20 years, because, you know, back in the day, a uh, Winnipeg company would sell to a broker in Ontario. Uh, Ontario would, would get a hold of a Dutch broker and, and you'd have a German customer. Now with, you uh, instant uh, telecommunication uh, that we're we're dealing business directly with European brokers, Chinese brokers, uh, uh, American customers. We're about uh, half, uh, we're two to three million dollars in sales. We're uh, for the most part US driven, some domestic sales, but we do appreciate our European and Chinese customers. Uh, one of the things that came across our desk was the Chinese market because uh, some of our varieties are Maybe not like rocket fuel, four cut varieties, but man, they do well in China. China doesn't have the snow. Uh, it's sometimes it's in fertile ground. And you go in, in, into Northern Manchuria, uh, some of the Northern, well, all of Northern China can be no snow and brutal conditions. And we're finding some of the older varieties are doing really well. And, and that's where it's pretty exciting. Uh, there's some opportunities for us just just doing some of the common uh, uh, older types of alfalfa that uh, can really, you know, come through the winter, and especially this year. We like it's like a skating rink for much of the Inner Lake and parts of Eastern Manitoba with uh, warm temperatures through January, February, and um, it looks like the alfalfa has come through. Uh, and that's where this blend. Uh, if you can go on to the next slide, yeah, thank you. Uh, I think we've got a, a good mix here, uh, Joe, that we're, you know, the, the trifoliate, it's it's a newer. Uh, so Paul, you know. can, I inter can I interrupt you? Sure, okay. I was I was gonna introduce this slide, but- uh, oh, oh, uh, Sure. I, I am, uh, this is just a different world for, for me. And and for those of you that I'm sure watch the webinar, I do yep. all of our, uh, our annual blends, but um, so when we partnered with Interlake Forge Seed, basically the instruction I gave to Paul is obviously we're looking for a diverse blend, something that we can get one to do cuts off and then uh, utilize grazing um, come fall. So maybe I'll, I'll, I'll tee up here, Paul. Basically, we've got two blends, a light land, light land blend and a heavy land blend. Um, but we're going to dive into it a bit here. Um, so maybe this is the, the perennial hay uh, Lightland blend. Maybe just talk a little bit about what makes it more designed for uh, Lightland, and then we can kind of get more into the specifics as far as plant species. Yeah. Okay, Joe. That's that's great. Uh, yeah. You know, if you, you see there's got you know all eight different species there, and each of these species has has a different function. Um, and as Joe was saying, that it's all about biodiversity, and 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 like no single. Uh, variety of alfalfa is going to do it all. Uh, like for example, if you have a really wet year, you're going to see uh, the trefoil, the timothy, the creeping root of alfalfa come through. And if it's dry, you know, just to try to pull it mulch leaf. Uh, and you know, on the grasses, um, this is this could be used, you know, hay or pasture. Uh, I think it'd be ideal for you know a cut and gray system because what we're seeing is the newer grasses are better protein. Uh, it's frustrating when you go to neighbors hay fields that have been there for 15, 20 years, and there's an alfalfa plant every 20 feet. Uh, they could be doing so much better, and and you know tying up carbon, uh, just feeding a lot more cows, and, and this is really brought home to us in the drought, you know, three years ago where it didn't rain. We just had grasshoppers and ground pastures, and but I know I was very proud of some of our hay customers. Uh, that they yeah they had enough hay you know they they kept their stands current uh they you know good fertility and people were getting rid of their 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 herds like it was uh it was a pretty frustrating frustrating time to be in a in a cattle business just the price of hay went crazy but for those guys that that you know had relatively good hay management they they had enough and uh and that's just reflected in in this this uh current blend like you're you know you've got again um 
when you have the different alfalfa varieties that that you can you're more resilient to whatever mother nature gives to you and and i i look back that um I, i'm dating myself but we helped uh see the the winnipeg floodway <laughs> and, <Yeah. laughs> and, you know and, and the last many years ago yes. um and and that hay is still there because it's a creeping root of alfalfa like it uh uh matrix uh, that's that's our own variety is is in there uh, it's one of the two creeping ones um there are some grass Maybe, root Paul, Paul, Sorry, I, I, I i always like when i put on the my webinar hat i always like to put on just the my farmer hat and ask uh from a perspective of a farmer Maybe I, I I know I've asked you this because we've had calls like this, but uh, I think it's really interesting and something that's not educated on enough is the different varieties of alfalfa and what we're trying to achieve here with the, the three different species. So maybe would you touch on just each one individually as far as what their plant characteristics are and why they're in the blend? Sure. Okay. So the creeping rooted uh, alfalfa, it's a bit lower, uh, more of a grazing type. But if you go into the Manitoba, uh, you know, hayseed, uh, species descriptor that it's it, uh, creeping rooted alfalfas do better in wet and dry conditions. It, it's kind of an oxymoron, but it, but it is true. Um, you go into any of the literature that uh, the roots are shallower, but um, they they take it they scavenge the moisture that's there. Uh, the downside is not as productive. You're not going to get three cuts, three massive cuts, but you will get two cuts. Um, and then the trifolia alfalfa, it's a it's a fairly it's a newer uh, alfalfa, good disease tolerance, uh, more of a three to four cut. And, uh, but in some cases, um, you know, you get a really tough year, they're, they're not going to make it. But the, uh, you know, circling back to our matrix creeping rooted type, um, we've been in flooded situations where the, the field was brown and dead. It was just nothing, nothing living. And, and uh, by July, it was green again. It's just so nice to see that um, when the main crown dies out, the, the roots can take over. And being a true creeping alfalfa, it, it can, if you have low spots in the field, and if the competition is not too heavy, fertility is there, it'll, it'll be the alfalfa will creep right in. Uh, that's one of the challenges of creeping rooted alfalfa is that uh, when you have seed production, uh, to keep the rows thin, and, and you just, you always, we do a lot of integral cultivation. Um, and that, you know, so that's a challenge again to, Know, keep the stand population down but that's what you want for hay and pasture uh the malty leaf uh, that's a, again our variety uh you know good good disease tolerance uh, and, and it was listed uh multi 501 uh and they're using uh, a couple other ones too uh bns um but you know we're, we look for winter hardiness and we look for productivity uh and again that's a three cut uh in some cases a four cut um, our multi five for one will go all the way down to uh, Iowa and Missouri through there, and it's again it's not rocket fuel, it's not a five cut, but but it does it does well. Uh, Timothy you know, standard. Um, I'm gonna. You know, I'm sorry, sorry, Paul. I, I yeah. as usual have follow up questions. Maybe just talk about the winter hardiness between the three different types of alfalfa. Yeah. Okay. So uh, for the uh, there's a fall dormancy for. The uh, multi leaf and the trifoliate, the winter hardiness of two and fall dormancy of four. The creeping rooted uh, alfalfa is uh, winter hardiness of two and a fall dormancy of three. So, fall dormancy is just an indicator how uh, productive the alfalfas are. Uh, and uh, again, um, you know, by putting all three types of alfalfa in there, you're just more resilient for, you know, the different weather conditions. So uh, fall dormancy, a higher number is a higher total plant biomass potential. Well, yeah, a higher a higher number in in four dormancy and fall dormancy uh, indicates that you're going to get more tonnage generally. Like there's some fives and sixes out there, um, and that to be more for southern Ontario or you know just you no know, again warmer areas. And in Western Canada, threes and fours dominate the the trade. Um, but people are looking for a two dormancy. You can get uh, a, a two winter or fall. You can you can get a two fall dormancy and two winter hardiness, but not quite as productive. Uh, like a Bonquin would be a three, and that that's considered uh, an old standby. But um, and uh, a winter yeah. hardiness three is as hardy as it gets. Uh, yeah, no two. Uh, like again, that's 
two different things we're talking about. Fall, fall dormancy is the, you know, the length of season and productivity and winter hardiness is, is of course, the, the, just the uh, wintering ability of the alfalfa. Right. So that's, so, that's yeah. Sorry, I didn't mean, mean to interrupt, but uh, feel free to, to touch on the grasses. And of course, I want to talk about the, the bird's foot trefoil and uh, the non-bloat components of that. Uh, yeah, species. that's right. Uh, the tall fescue we have is it's a really good BNS uh, uh, newer uh, low endophyte uh, tall fescue, and and I'm really seeing you know we put some Timothy in because people, it's that's traditional and some guys like Timothy, but uh, honestly when when the drought conditions hit, the only thing that it was growing after in the heat and a dryness um, is is tall fescue, and you know it's an amazing ability to. Uh, uh, stockpile graze in the fall or take a two, three cuts uh, later in the season. And uh, it's just a game changer. And same with uh, metal brome. It, it's just more of a, a resilient grass. Um, and we, you know, we, we could put in, uh, we could have put in uh, uh, just common smooth brome, but um, again, that will sometimes, that creeps and that will sometimes limit your alfalfa tonnage. Uh, orchard grass, that's the protein. That's um, you know, or that's the sweetness in the protein. Um, and you know, again, a newer uh, Canadian variety that is you know, quite you know quite winter hardy. And then uh, trefoil. Um, I like trefoil because it's uh, you know flood tolerant, drought tolerant, um, and with the high tannins, the condensed tannins in there, it just makes it uh, you know an easier on a and animal's GI gut. Uh, and it is, you know, again, it's not big tonnage. Uh, we're trying to get more dairy people into uh, trefoil uh, because ruminant um, entric emissions, everybody's concerned about, you know, um, carbon emissions from livestock industry. And if we're to use more trefoil, the researchers, uh, um, we all know that that will help out in entric emissions. And, and that's the biggest reason that's in for. 5% is not a lot, but it's a very tiny seed. So it's about a third the size of a falfa. So really, you know, a pound of tree foil is like three pounds of falfa, and and you'll you'll see it out there. Um, everything's been inoculated in the blend. Um, it's it's been proven. So, uh, bird's foot tree foil, Paul. I know you're not a beef nutritionist, unless you are. You've got to wear a lot of hats. <laughs> uh, but maybe just talk a little bit about the condensed tannins and and what's going on there to reduce bloat. Yeah. Um, well, we have our own variety uh, in there. It's called Bruce. It's developed by uh, Dr. Yusuf Papadopoulos from Our Culture Canada, a uh, tremendous uh, researcher. Uh, he's been around for many years, uh, and I, hopefully we can snag him. Uh, he's pretty near retirement age. But Re Yusuf got me on to, um, you know, just looking at, and, it's, and that's in our website too, but looking at... Uh, the different tree full varieties and how they affect animals, our animal health, and uh, what we know that that there's the, the tannins, um, you know, in the animal just to slow down digestion. It allows more of the of the mass of vegetation to go right to the gut, like so. In, in a room, and it just it doesn't blow up into as much gas. I mean, the digestion, of course, some digestion takes place, but it just allows more of that that mass of uh, vegetation to go right into the large intestine and that's going to produce your milk and your meat. And, and that's so important on that. So I think we'll just move on to the next one. So very similar species. I, I think probably important to, to touch on red clover, um, uh, I think, Paul, and why it's in the heavy blend. But maybe just touch on a little bit of the difference uh, between the two blends and the difference in seeding rate. Um, I don't know if you picked up on the light uh, land, but it's a heavier seeding rate than the than the uh, heavy land. But maybe touch on red clover first, Paul, and then uh, we can kind of touch on the different characteristics. of the Sure. Blend. So yeah, as you notice, there's, there's less of falcon here and, and that's balanced out by the red clover. Um, often uh, that, you know, with, with the heavier soils, you can get, um, you know, just you know, imperfect drainage. And that's where red clover comes in. Uh, you know, red clover, it's not a, a big favorite uh, for a lot of people because it's, it's uh, slower to dry down, but it, it sure beats having just 
putting up straight grass. Like it, it's a uh, double cut red clover. It, it's good for many, you know, several seasons. Um, and um, we're finding that, especially the guys that have rolling topography, that they, they appreciate that clover in the holes because uh, if alpha year after year flooding, it will, it will flood out, it will drown out. And um, the newer types of red clover, they're, they're productive, they're winter hardy. Um, and they're doing a, they're doing a good job out there. So the difference, like, uh, in the blends, uh, heavy versus light land, there's, uh, less alfalfa, higher percentage of birds with trefoil and the red clover. So maybe just touch on how come, uh, um, less alfalfa in the heavy, uh, land, Paul, and you know, why more something like birds with trefoil? Well, yeah, you know, with, with the heavier, like, uh, again, uh, Joe, um, you know, 30% of alpha doesn't seem like much, but with the tiny seed of a alpha and a higher seeding rate, you're still going to see lots of alpha out there. Um, and maybe, I, give, maybe give an example, Paul, just like, because lots of people are not that familiar with the seed size of alfalfa versus Timothy versus Meadow Brome. What can somebody that's sowing, uh, say this blend specifically, that's 30% alfalfa, what a what percentage of that plant biomass, say at first oh, cut, be alfalfa? Yeah, you're well. If it's in a dry year, you're going to see mostly alfalfa. If it's a wet year, you're going to see quite a bit of grass in there. <laughs> but but if you're if you're going to go uh, and seeds per pound, um, you're going to because um, not Timothy. Timothy's you no know, a very small seed, but with the meadow brome orchard and tall fescue, uh, four. I'm ballparking four to five times uh, the size. So and in terms of uh, seeds per pound. Uh, you're you're looking at roughly equivalent of a alfalfa to grass, and and uh, especially uh, with tree foil and red clover thrown in there, you're you're going to be seeing uh, again on an average precipitation, it'll be it, it'll be largely alfalfa, but you'll have the grass poking through, and, yeah. and that's what that's what we want. I you know, and and again, there's one of the questions that came up in a in a chat room or in a Q and A was that why why see grass if it's come in, but um, the grasses that normally come in Enter Lake and Northern Parkland area is June grass or uh, Kentucky bluegrass. And to me, it's great for turf, but just absolutely lousy uh, for hay. I mean, it can you can graze it in, in the right years and, and you know when the moisture is there. But you know we're we're in times of higher heat and high, and more dryness, um, and that's where you need the orchard and tall fescue and brome to come in. Um, it does better protein and you're going to get, you're, you're aiming for two to three cuts. And it's just, uh, the resilience is there and the, the protein and the growth is there in those, in those species. So Paul, one of the questions we had, uh, from one of the, uh, people that registered and actually came up in the Q and a here is, uh, talk about warm season perennials. Um, just, uh, I, I mean, different characteristics of a warm season perennial, but also, um how come uh you didn't include a warm season perennial in this blend well yeah the warm season perennials just aren't winter hardy <laughs> I, i'm trying to think uh yeah like they're you know like you know maybe if you go to uh wisconsin uh would have you but you no know, generally they're they're just not they're not winter hardy can you give us some examples of some species that you've seen in the like the warm season perennials Anything that you've seen uh, that you've had luck with in the prairies? Yeah, no, I, I really have it um, for it. Um, you know, like sorghum Sudan grass, like there's, yeah, there is, uh, uh, I, I don't, I, I have to be honest with you, I don't have much experience. I've really never really uh, considered putting a warm season in up here. Um, it just like, you know, like it, again, it's not very common. It might work, but I'd like to, I'd like to see it first. And that's where um, I got interested in covering coal because the nephew put some in and you get kind of cynical in a seed trade when you see this advertising, that advertising. And I, I went out to his field and I said, oh my God, that's <laughs> there's something happening here with the diversity and the tonnage. And it was so, it wasn't so early. It was so the first week of June and going out to uh, Joe's field, I, I couldn't believe it was just a jungle. And and it wasn't a wasn't a great year. We had some dry patches and the sheer heat, but it just yeah. And, and that's what kind of turned me on to uh, your you know your your blends. 
So I got, I got one question and I'm pretty sure there's a spelling error in it, Paul, but is there any truth to the statement that it takes five bites of, I think, fescue to offset one bite of red clover? What's, I guess, what's your experience with red clover and is, have you seen the issues? Oh, uh, no, I'm mean, red clover. It's great. It's just, it's just a, a species that you, you don't want to put a whole lot of uh, poundage in there because it's, it's slower to dry down. Uh, now, when you, one of the issues, like with the older varieties of tall fescue, especially is endophytes, like endophytes and poor palatability. But you know, the, these varieties we or we put in are are newer varieties. They're, they're really, uh, you know, you'll see a lot better performance than than let's say a variety that's ten years old. Uh, so yeah, that's. But I just uh, I just look at the productivity um, and. Uh, you know the tonnage that you can get from a, a good tall tall fescue in your in your hay crop. It's it's phenomenal compared to um, you know many other grasses. Um, well, I yep. was going to ask you one more question, Paul, but well, sure. we might as well get it. We might as well get it to uh, to uh, question period. So we get guys uh, Dakota and Wyatt, if you want to turn your uh, your videos and your mics on. Um, Dakota has been warm. Dakota is not uh, an expert in uh, perennial hay. So if we if you have questions from a, a funding standpoint, we can fire them away. Um, but uh, we talked about this a little bit with Wyatt's uh, and Paul. I know you're uh, very well versed in this, but what are some things to avoid or strategies that you guys do in fall uh, when grazing livestock to um, uh, I guess reduce threat of winter kill, and I know why you've been grazing um, straight alfalfa, which I bet there's some people out there that would be curious what you do as far as strategies. So why why don't you uh, tackle that one first, and then Paul, um, if you've got something to add, you can uh, take her away from there. Yeah, for us with the uh, grazing straight alfalfa, is we just try to wait till we have a really good killing frost, and you'll notice those alfalfa plants start to wilt and the uh, leaves kind of a bit bend over and stuff like that and that's when usually when it's good to graze uh we'll just kick them right out onto it we've been doing it for since i've been alive so and had no problems with it uh, if we as long as we get that good killing frost you don't, just because you got a frost doesn't mean that it's dead it's got to be a killing frost so what what temperature is that at wyatt and how many days at post uh were you kicking cows out uh, it's hard to know the exact temperature. I know some people say it was specific temperature, but for us, we kind of just look at the plant and as long as it's wilting and not coming back up during the day, then, you know, it's, um, done. I don't ever usually put them out on, with an empty stomach either. I like to feed them before I kick them out there. So they're not just loading up on alfalfa and then they can just start grazing. Um, usually we do have some cover crop available or green feed regrowth that they can graze also, but mostly it's just straight alfalfa that they're grazing. And then what are you leaving behind, Wyatt? Um, it, we don't leave too much behind unless it's a juvenile alfalfa that we don't want to winter kill. Um, Cause like you always worry about them pulling the actual plant out of the ground, right? So we'll graze young alfalfa to about six inches or so. Uh, but the, older stuff we graze until it, they're not wanting to be in there anymore and then we start feeding them so yeah. the odd year we'll put some pellets out there to force them to eat a little longer but for the most part we just graze it till it's short and call it good paul you got anything to add on that front no that, that sounds good but uh so, if I, sure go ahead joe you well you i i think uh, i literally when we had this call this was probably a month ago you had some uh dates as far as when's a good time to take first cut, when's a good time to take second cut, and then uh, just uh, generic uh, strategies as far as grazing. Well, just like that green and gold, I, I'm a board member of Manitoba Forging Grasslands, and we always try, like we have the green gold program, and, and it's all about, uh, you know, first first blossom. And, and but also, you know, being being a realist, uh, look at the forecast. And I mean, if if you have a Colorado low coming at, no, <laughs> go fishing, uh, do whatever. But uh, anytime after mid-June, 
you know, we, we work with some dairy farmers down in the southeast part of the province. They, they normally get three cuts and sometimes four cuts, whereas up here, most of the neighbors one cut. Um, and it, you, it's and, and they have good stats, like year after year. They're, they're sitting on several thousand dollar an acre land and they need the income. And, um, and you know, our three, four years, they don't want to keep their alfalfa longer than that, uh, sometimes five years. Uh, because they'll rotate in the sugar beets or, or elsewhere. Uh, the one thing I wanted to add is on warm season grasses, now there's warm season natives. I thought that maybe that should have been explained. I was talking about warm other warm season grasses. Warm season natives like big blue stem and switchgrass, we have sold, we have marketed successfully. They're, they're, they're productive. Um, they, uh, there's nothing wrong with them. But very expensive and hard to establish. Like we we've grown a, a fair bit of big blue over the years, and and this is with a sugar beet seeder. This is you know really really good seeding techniques, and believe me, it, it's not easy. Uh, they don't take competition, and uh, they take a while to grow. So um, I think there's nothing wrong with them. But if you want to pay twelve dollars a pound for grass and have high risk. And uh, it could be, you know, it, it's there. So if I, I stand- Is the advantage with the big blue stem, is it must be drought tolerant or heat tolerant? Yeah, yeah, it both drought and heat tolerant. And, it, and it's like an oak tree. Once you put it in, it's there for a long time. So the root structure um, on all, most, most of the native grasses are very deep and they'll go down straight to the water table. Um, and, but most guys, when stuff gets more than five, $6 a pound, they really- shy away from that just from the dollars and cents part of it and it's a fluffy seed uh like a a 20 by 30 bag of blue stem is like 10 pounds like it's just like one big pillow and the guys will say well how do you see it and well yeah <laughs> so <laughs> you know i mean you can code it and, and there's different strategies but uh it's really difficult to seed some of the stuff and switchgrass is a bit better um, but again, you just don't see it. They, they're, you know, like the cool seasons are, uh, it, especially uh, tall fescue and orchard that have some heat tolerance. Um, that's that's where the industry is going. So, uh, you guys, I we got a question about longevity of hay stands, but I've I've thought of another educational opportunity. We will call it. Um, I mean, Wyatt, I know you're uh, doing uh, monocrop alfalfa, but. I want to talk about how long you guys are leaving hay stands in and and Wyatt, I want to ask you what you're seeing as far as residual nitrogen after uh, taking out that uh, alfalfa stand. But Paul, maybe if you touch on as well, um, which variety of alfalfa is better for nitrogen production and uh, nodulation? Um, so the start of the question was how long you're leaving a hay stand in, and the second part uh, is different for both of you. Paul, Paul wondering which alfalfa is better, and Wyatt wondering um, what you're seeing as far as re residual nitrogen after. So, Paul, why don't you take a stab at that first? Yeah, um, I, I, I haven't seen any literature indicating there's different amounts of, of uh, nitrogen fixation or nodulation with that, but I would say that if you have a sandy uh, arid condition, you, you know, a, a creeping root of alpha is best. But when I look at, uh, you know, the variables in prairie agriculture, like a few years ago, South Houston Saskatchewan was, was flooding. So, you know, uh, that's why we're putting in, in three different varieties that you can just capture whatever Mother Nature gives to you. And, and even um, uh, like the tap-rooted uh, types of alfalfa, uh, they can go down to moisture too. Like it's just that, uh, again, they don't, in, in some cases, they don't have the drought tolerance. Uh, and then we like to see your stands four to five years and it all, it, but then we like up here, a lot of neighbors have rocks and roots and everything else they don't want to see. And uh, then I'll put like maybe half paper rooted, half tap rooted and, and then two cuts. Uh, but we have to remember too, uh, the other part of it is uh, soil fertility. And you could have, I just made some notes here, like boron, potassium, which is not normally uh, shortage, but phosphate, magnesium. Um, if your plants are, are yellowing or stunted or a little bit reddish, like just take some tissue samples or take some soil samples because um, a, a, a few micronutrients can go a long way 
we like to put down a fair bit of phosphate when we uh, seed the alfalfa. Uh, and but just like your cover crops, uh, the other presenter is saying that when you're putting in the cover crops, I think they do a good job of scavenging whatever is in the soil profile. So that that that's going to help. Uh, I know sunflowers and a different deep rooted uh, tap roots really help in that. But just to keep in mind that just because it's a fallop, it doesn't mean it's a low input crop. Like you're taking a lot of tonnage off and, and sometimes something like boron, zinc, uh, or, you know, sulfur can come up as a, uh, you know, as a, a, a shortage and that will affect it. Um, when we're doing seed production locally here, we like to give a full meal deal because we want to see a plant two to three feet high. We want to see little trees growing. And we like right now, this again for seed production, uh, we have uh, 22 inch rows uh, and and we want to see a nice tall plant. And and yet we can go to some neighbor's fields and the plants are barely a foot high. And, you know, same, basically the same soil, same uh, precipitation, but it's all about, the, you know, feeding the plant. Um, and so that's, I'd really encourage guys to take a soil test and practice for our fertility and, and go from there. Cool. Wyatt, uh, I don't know if you remember the original question. How long are you leaving in a stand? And, and you know, what's probably a good idea is, is kind of what your strategy is the following year and what you're seeing for residual in. So we'll usually do about three years of alfalfa. And then the fourth year, we'll do the cover crop and alfalfa together and try to do a four-year rotation on all of our alfalfa, just to keep it fresh and current because we find that the longer we leave it, the less tonnage we're getting out of it. And under irrigation, uh, we'll take two cuts. Some people take three, but we like to take two and then graze the third. So yeah. that's been the best practice for us. Um, they are either hauling it off your field or hauling it on. So we, we figured we might as well graze that third cut because it's usually not enough to warrant running machinery over it. Um, so that's why we figured it's just better to graze it. So are you you uh you're taking that alfalfa out of production Wyatt for one year and I think this is a question I'll circle back around because like a lot of uh cattle producers they're taking a uh, productive hay land out of production and they want it put back into perennial hay as, as quickly as they can so Wyatt I'm curious uh what you do on your farm and and Paul kind of what you've seen as well Wyatt if you want to tackle it, that first. it'll be out of alfalfa for three years three years okay yeah so three years of a uh, green feeder cover crop, and now we're doing the cover crop because we're really enjoying that. And then we'll put it back into alfalfa just to keep that current and performing as much as we can. Uh, we have quite a demand for feed around here. So that's why we keep it so current, just like Paul was saying, the more current you can keep your alfalfa, the more tonnage you're gonna get. And we do have noticed like a quite a bit of residual nitrogen like you're talking. Um, being left in the soil, usually the first two years of having cover crop, we're noticing a bump in production. Um, and that was with just a mono crop, but I'm noticing with the cover crops, it's just utilizing it better and it's lasting a little longer and putting back into it. We're not needing to add that fertilizer where we were usually hammering quite a bit of fertilizer to it because we're lacking so much because the alfalfa takes so much out, but leaves nitrogen. So, yeah. Paul, what do you recommend for producers? How long, how many years should should that hay stay out of production for or be out of perennial for? Yeah, yeah. well, again, three to four years, unless you have rocks and roots and then you want to, <laughs> then it's going to be 10 to 15 years. But but honestly, you know, most most of the time, very, very seldom, even on cheap land that's, that you've inherited, uh, you got to take it out in 10 years. Uh, and, but that, um, again, the autotoxicity part, um, for for alfalfa, it's it has to be three years. Like you have, uh, you know, the different compounds, the roots, exudates that are given off will will kill the young alfalfa plants. So you know, a good three years um, out of out of crop. So an alfalfa, like if say you take one cut and that alfalfa goes to seed, Paul, that elf those existing established alfalfa plants are not going to allow new germination of those uh, fresh seeds. Uh, no, we do see that, we do see that in seed production, but you know sometimes you can get um, like a hundred pounds of seed on the ground, <laughs> you know, like a windstorm. So you have to look at that. Whereas you know ten to fifteen pounds that's the recommended rate for alfalfa seed. So yeah, you will see some 
uh, you know, some uh, volunteers come through any kind of seed crop. Uh, even sometimes, we, you know, we'll put down different soil sterilants that they'll come through. But when it's a hay system, it, you don't, um, yeah, you don't normally see that. Well, you don't, first of all, you don't have the seed happening. But um, yeah, like just that's that's what the agronomists recommend is uh, you know good uh, three years out of production from alfalfa the alfalfa stand to alfalfa stand. So uh, the next question we get asked this a lot. I'm actually going to throw this over to you, Dakota. Um, uh, lots of farms are wondering about they either got an old hay stand or an old pasture that is just grasses uh, and want to uh, revigorate that uh, land with legumes. Um, Dakota, I'm not sure if, if there's funding available for that in all three provinces. Sorry to put you on the spot, um, but just your knowledge on that topic. Yeah, absolutely. Um, there is funding available in all three provinces for that. Um, and there's going to be a multitude of different organizations that kind of do deliver that. But there is absolutely opportunities out there for rejuvenation of uh, old pastures. And that's if you like drones uh, for seeding are getting quite popular. That's you can seed that or uh, apply it with a drone, Dakota. Yeah, I can speak to my own experience on that one. Um, as far as when I was delivering the program, there's different ways and different kind of rates that are applied um, for each practice on kind of how you are delivering um, those legumes to rejuvenate that pasture um, or old hay stand. Um, you know, specific to the Prairie Watershed Client Program in Saskatchewan, um, that would have to be a pasture component because it would fall under the rotational grazing for Saskatchewan. Cool. Um, and Paul, we talked about a little a little about this before we came on, but um, what are you hearing as far as or or hearing from producers or from uh, the literature as far as what plant species uh, in a scenario like that um, have the best chance of survival or to flourish? Yeah, I uh, just from a little bit of like we don't do a lot of pasture seeding up here, but there's Ray Bittner, there's a few other old hands at it, uh, and and there's some of the newer agronomists that the department put out are uh, you're working with. It has to be legumes, like the uh, putting a grass in the grass. You're pretty well wasting your money. Like you're you're far better off putting a alfalfa, especially creeping of the alfalfa um, in there, uh, free foil, red clover, but any of the legume species do fine. Uh, and we're finding some pretty good success with the falfa and tree foil. Uh, one uh, one note for I, I I guess for Dakota, I just saw this in the water. I just saw this in the cooperator here that Manitoba Association of Watersheds have expanded to all air, agro area, areas of Manitoba. So because we we're working with some guys down by uh, uh, Moore and Winkler, and they were they didn't they were not in any watershed. But so there are some gaps in the watershed. Uh, districts, but now 100% of, of agro Manitoba is covered. So if guys, uh, uh, and a surprise number of growers, I don't know what watershed they're in, but again, you go to uh, SAW, Saskatchewan Association of Watersheds, or MA, Manitoba Association of Watersheds, if, uh, if you don't know, uh, or your local ag department, um, and, and that's just great. They're good staff. Like we're working to East Interlake Watershed District. They're great people. There's good agronomy people there, um, and time well spent. And this, this is our carbon tax dollars at work. Yeah, I think just to add to that, and just kind of, I know I touched on the presentation, but but those watershed districts they have a multitude of programming even outside of what we would discuss tonight. Um, so I definitely encourage you to have those conversations with those local contacts because. Even outside the perennial forage, outside prairie watershed, there's still more um, to be explored in those opportunities and, and a ton of good programs. Um, I know some watersheds in Manitoba even have equipment rentals, different things like that. Um, tree planting, I've heard as well. Water retention projects. Um, there's a ton of good opportunities out there. So definitely worth checking out, uh, whether it's a website or a phone call, and just kind of reach out and make that uh, relationship there. Good, good point, Dakota. Um, I got a couple more questions here. Uh, uh, guys, I don't want to keep you too late. We're going to try and wrap this up by uh, by nine thirty. Um, I think I'll I'll kick it to Wyatt first, and then you, Paul. Um, basically, just wondering what you've tried as far as establishing uh, perennial seed, and I'm talking strictly seeding here. Um, I think the two options. Correct me if I'm wrong, but obviously seeding or broadcasting. Uh, why just wondering what you've tried or what you've seen success with um, just for people that haven't done it before or have done it one way and not the other way. Um, 
but yeah, just curious your experience and then Paul will throw it over to you. We haven't done any broadcasting. We either uh, no till seeded in or we'll work it and seed it. Uh, that's just our experience and what works for us. Um, also availability of drills in our area. So nice. we just kind of are at the mercy of other people. We do like the direct seeding just to save that carbon and to uh, lock in some moisture, even under irrigation. We're always wanting to keep as much moisture as possible. But uh, just in the practices that we have right now, we've had to work our fields and uh, due to getting rid of gophers and whatnot. So um, we're using a box drill, this drill from the neighbors. And that's how we seed our our perennials and whatnot. So, have you noticed any difference as far as time of year, or have, are you guys always aiming for that end of May? Uh, we try to do like early May, end of May, when uh, for all of our uh, green fee crops, and that's when we're seeding our alfalfa with it. Also, um, we don't. I, there is people that will do like seven pounds in the spring of alfalfa, and then another seven pounds in the fall. But for us, we figure we might as well put it all in at once and and that it's worked for us. We always seem to get a pretty good germination and longevity of the alfalfa. We usually more struggle with the species of alfalfa that are available to us in our area. Um, we mostly want two cuts, but it seems like now most people are gearing to those three to four cuts and that doesn't really work for our practice, but that seems to be what's around mostly to buy it for alfalfa seed. Paul, you got anything to add to that? As far as oh, I have, sure, uh, you, you would have experience with broadcasting, or just what have you seen on that <laughs> from that standpoint? Yeah, actually, quite a few of our our hay clients uh, they float it on. They just go to a local uh, nutrient dealer and they dump in uh, the seed with the. Uh, their uh, fertilizer and, and just float it on. Uh, some of the guys at Valmars, uh, we're working dairy guys that they'll normally put down um, barley, wheat, uh, uh, flax as a cover crop, and then it just float on a Harrow bar, like a Valmar on top, and then a uh, Harrow pack or, or just you know, uh, pack with rollers. Uh, that's pretty common. Um, I, you know, but I, I just, I think what uh, you're doing in Alberta, Wyatt, that, that sounds, better like because with the we've had some stand failures um in the past like because of uh blowing dirt and everything else and i think if guys could go more precision seeding and getting it right into the soil at that half you know half inch depth uh that's better but again you know i'm not going to tell a farmer to do this or not to do this but one of the things is get forage established insurance um you're going to get covered for most of the costs uh, and why not? But uh, uh, I think with the warmer, drier conditions, um, yeah, going with a, a seed drill, drilling it in is that's that's the uh, gold standard, definitely. Cool. Um, I'm just going to quickly give away the prizes for best questions. Uh, <laughs> I don't know why balloons are happening. I have no idea, but that's kind of neat. Uh, <laughs> uh, Mike McGilvery, you're going to get the hat and I'm going to ask your question next. Uh, I do have to give one shout out to uh, Charlotte. Charlotte's been on a lot of our webinars and is very active in the, the Q&A since this is the last one of the year. Charlotte, I got a small jacket coming your way. Uh, thanks again for all the questions, you guys. Um, but this is, I guess, more of a question to Wyatt and has to do with, um, uh, I guess, the last topic that we were talking about. But have you ha had any experience with seeding 60 to 70% of recommended rate, then cross seeding at 60 to 70% of rate? Uh, Wyatt, I know you were talking about two different passes at different depths. Uh, any, uh, I mean, difference you've seen as far as direction of one crop versus the other? Well, this was actually the same pass. They put it all in in one oh, pass. Oh, same pass, right. Yeah, so um, we haven't done the cross uh, seeding uh, before. We usually just put it all in at the same time, uh, whether it was direct seeded or uh, uh, we tilled in and with box drill. So... That's just our experience. I wouldn't say I'm a super farmer by any means. I'm more of a rancher, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> that's just uh, what we've done and it has worked in our area for us, so. Nice. Paul, wondered if, what you think of that strategy? Yeah, I I, I really think I like that strategy. If you don't have a good seed bed, sometimes the guys are, you know, like just, you get a crop spraying and the seed bed's not ideal and you got those 
baseball sized lumps of soil. Um, I could really see some a strategy like that working, uh, where you can just go go twice and then just make it a, a better firmer seed bed if if you don't have that nice uh, firm seed bed uh, where there's lumps and stuff. I think that would be ideal. That would be a, a great way to overcome that that challenge. Paul, what about uh minimal uh disturbance drill like a zero till drill where there's a decent amount of residue what do you oh uh you yeah again uh that's that would be you know most guys don't have that i know there's a westman ear um watershed that will rent them out and i would like i would love it if our watershed districts uh could do the same but you know it's a hundred thousand dollars a drill but if, you know that you're not going to use too often um and that's a challenge but yeah like back in the day i know department of agriculture rented out the zero till drills and they were they kept, were kept busy and they did a good job but it's just uh the the, the costing to do so uh and 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 you know i i would say even in the dry years like 80 90 percent of the guys are still pretty happy with uh uh you know with with the uh results uh sometimes guys will say well what what about the german seed but then they go out and the entire tracks perfect germination <laughs> so uh <laughs> you know like and that and that tells you right there I, a big challenge though is um not so much the seeding rate but just bloody weather uh that you'll have the crop come up nice and and this is why some of the seeds expensive because uh timothy it's been really tough to get it going like you'll have a nice catch of timothy uh, uh july and then end of july august the heat wave comes and just fries it so, you know, I think that's more of a challenge for us. It's just, it's not too bad to get the crop going, but to keep it going and to anticipate the, the proper amount of uh, cover overhead, like the, the uh, uh, green cover that you want some, but not too much. Um, and and just luck, because if you don't have rain for two, three months and, and you're, you're pretty well done for the grasses. Back to so, the seed bed you're talking there, we actually will work it up and to make it so that we got a nice firm seed bed, we'll run a rock roller over it. It helps also for our disc binds so that we're not raking blades. So we'll rock roll it and then seed it. And then we're getting that close depth of seed that we want. And I assume why you're putting on water as soon as the drill's out of the field? You betcha, yeah. We usually get water first week in May, uh, like 10th of May usually. So it, that's where we're trying to get the seed in as close to that time as possible and then get some moisture on it because the more regrowth we get the sooner the seeds in there so yeah yeah it i, I yeah i concur with uh why it like it's kind of silly running up and down uh the field for a tractor and empty drill but i i've done that more than once just uh mm -hmm. breaking up the lumps and then when you got a good seed bed then then you, you know you start seeding um i'm gonna make this the last question you guys but you can uh uh be as long-winded as you want on that um also, thank you very much for coming on, Dakota. <laughs> I appreciate it. You got any feedback on this at all, uh, let me know. But uh, to the you guys that have been doing it for years and years and years, I always kind of leave it with a question like this. Um, th it can be biggest mistake you've made or biggest success you've made, but really try and talk to the producers that have no experience in this at all, uh, what to look out for what uh best strategies and what to what to look out for so maybe Wyatt we'll start with you and uh Paul if you want to finish up that'd be great honestly uh I'm gonna boast on here a little bit about the covers and cold but putting these cover crops in has been great for us it's lowering our inputs it's improving our soil quality and it's making so we don't have to buy fertilizer so it is for a rancher standpoint, it's been great for us. We get so much more regrowth, so we're it's great for our feed quality. Um, I can't boast enough about that. Uh, I don't, oh, what was the other part of that you're, question? You're in, you're in good company to boast yeah. about that, Wyatt. Yeah. <laughs> uh, uh, just best successes, what to look out for, for somebody that's just starting out. Uh, other thing I would say is it, if you're willing to do exactly like you guys say on the label pre-burn, I can't stress how much that does help to stop that competition right off the start. Um, no. We've done both and definitely better results with a pre-burn. So that is definitely the, the year that we didn't, we didn't see as good a results, but it's still amazing. But 
I would suggest a pre-burn and uh, be realistic with the amount of rainfall that you got in your area. I know we've been having some hard years, but a monocrop isn't going to do nearly as good as all these multi-species. So if you can keep a multi-species in your crop and you're growing forage, like I understand people need to make a cash crop, but a multi-species is always going to be better than your monocrop for feed quality and soil nutrition and lowering your inputs. Cool. Paul, you get the last word. I very rarely give up the last word, but I don't know enough about the subject. <laughs> <laughs> no, I know it's been great, Joe. I, I've learned uh, tonight, you know, just on, on cover crops. It, it's just lots of, uh, it's, a, it's a new paradigm. Uh, and like uh, the guys are saying, oh, we're, we're excited. Uh, my biggest challenge would be uh, just the seeding rate. You know, I, I think, uh, I think I, we often have neighbors running back two, three times and uh, all ran out of seed and then on Saturday afternoon and doing more, more seed and Sunday morning, but, but just setting the drills, that's, that's a priority, really watching what's going on. Um, and, and some of the seed blends too, that, that within a half hour, like you're gonna get that, that um, uh, seed density separation, the grass has been topped, the alfalfa below. And so, you know, to don't dump in a whole bunch of uh, blend into your, into your seeding implement because it will settle over time. Um, some of the challenges, um, just like why it's saying, you know, to, I, I, I've seen, I've seen very good success in, uh, uh, sod seeding and I've seen disasters and the guys that they didn't, they didn't really think about it. They didn't pre-burn, um, actually I'd like the guys to just even let it rot, you know, uh, the fall before burn it off and again in the spring, just because the seed's expensive, uh, you want it to work. And why not? Like if you can, you know, rot those roots and really kill whatever weeds, especially downy lines, with a couple of shots of Roundup, like in the spring and the fall. And there's fall fall application is great for a lot of perennial weeds, and and uh, uh, it should be done more often uh, because that's going to really raise the productivity uh, of those, you know, new pastures. Cool. Well, I appreciate everyone's time. Uh, it was an awesome webinar. It was a great webinar season. I thank everyone for uh, who tuned in over the course uh, of the winter. And uh, I guess we'll see you back in December. So thanks a lot, you guys. I really appreciate it to everyone watching. Uh, we really appreciate it and the continued support and uh, good growing season in 24. And uh, yeah, we'll see you all back here next fall. Thanks a lot, guys. Yeah, thanks, Joe. We'll see ya. Bye.